This episode 24 is the second of two parts that discuss supporting organizations as a special type of public charity. All supporting organizations must pass an organizational test, an operational test, a control test, and a relationship test. Supporting organizations are further classified as type 1, type 2, or type 3 supporting organizations based on how they satisfy the relationship test. In this episode, I'll recap the basic requirements that apply to all three types and then look more closely at the complex requirements for a type 3 supporting organization. Welcome to the EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferella Braun and Martel. My name is Cynthia Rowland. And I'm a partner at Ferella. I'm a business and tax lawyer with more than 30 years of experience advising clients on nonprofit and charity law. Through this podcast, our lawyers and guests will discuss a range of legal and business issues impacting the nonprofit world because we understand you work hard every day to make your community a better place to live and do business. Many of our programs focus on the basics, and at times we'll do a deep dive into narrow and complicated legal issues. Again, welcome to the EO Radio Show. We're glad you're here. Welcome to a complex discussion, or I should say a discussion of a complex topic about a special type of classification for public charities as supporting organizations. To recap the basic rules covered in episode 23, as you recall, in order to be classified as a supporting organization, which is an additional classification for 501c3s that intend to be public charities, not private foundations. Under the rules that apply to all supporting organizations, an organization that intends to be a public charity under this classification must satisfy four requirements in addition to otherwise meeting all the requirements of 501c3. So here are the four fundamental rules for a supporting organization. Number one. The organization must be organized to support or benefit one or more 509A1 or 509A2 public charities, with limited exceptions for organizations that support a labor union, business league, or a member-supported 501C4. Number two is the operational test. The organization must be operated to support or benefit one or more specified supported organizations. Number three, the organization may not be controlled by disqualified persons other than foundation managers and public charities. And number four, the organization must meet one of the relationship tests. These three types of relationships that are allowed are the following. Type one, which is a supporting organization that is operated, supervised, or controlled by its supported organization. Type two, the supported organization is supervised or controlled in connection with its supported organization. And number three, the type three supporting organization. A type three supporting org is operated in connection with one or more publicly supported organizations. So there you have it. It seems like an awful lot of defined terms packed into these rules. And again, putting this in context, this is for classification of a 501c3 as other than a private foundation. Now, as you may recall from earlier episodes, and I'll have a link in the show notes to the general discussion of public charity status under 509A1 or A2. So this is an important classification because public charities are not subject to the complex private foundation rules. For listeners who really want to understand how all of these public charity tests come together, you might want to look at Schedule A to Form 990. That Schedule A is where all of the requirements for public charity status are laid out in a single schedule, and the organization that's filing the 990 fills out only the part of Schedule A that applies to its classification. So as you look at Schedule A, and the link is in the show notes, you'll see that it's an eight-page schedule, and of those eight pages, Pages 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are devoted to supporting organization criteria. And Type 3 supporting organizations are on two pages of Schedule A devoted exclusively to the Type 3. And they're just full of fine print and detailed questions. So I'm not going to go through all of those requirements in this episode. But for listeners who want to follow along, you might pull out a copy of Schedule A on your computer screen while you listen, if you happen to be listening to this other than in a car or someplace where you can't follow along. So anyway, back to our main discussion the Type 3 Supporting Organization. This is a supporting org that is, as I said, operated in connection with one or more publicly supported organizations. 
The basic idea of the responsiveness test is that all supporting organizations must be responsive to the needs and demands of the supported organization and also must constitute an integral part of or maintain significant involvement in their supported organizations. Type 1 and Type 2 supporting organizations accomplish this responsiveness and integral part requirement by the design of their control relationships. That is, in Type 1, they're controlled by the supported org or operated or supervised by it. The Type 2 is supervised or controlled in connection with the supported organization. So that makes establishing responsiveness relatively easy. However, a Type 3 supporting organization is not subject to the same level of control by its supported organization, and it can have more than one supported organization. So the Type 3 supporting organizations face three additional filters, a notification requirement, a separate responsiveness, and a separate integral part test. So in brief, the notification requirement. A Type 3 supporting organization must provide the following documents annually to each of its supported organizations. A written notice describing the type and amount of support provided by the supporting organization to its supported organizations during the taxable year preceding the year in which the notice is provided. A copy of the supporting organization's Form 990 or 990EZ that was most recently filed on the date of the notification. And a copy of the supporting organization's governing documents as mostly recently amended if they haven't previously been provided. Now, here's a, the important point here. The information, this notification information, has to be provided by the last day of the fifth month following the close of the taxable year to which the information pertains. Note, this is just two weeks after the annual filing requirement for the federal tax return for the supporting organization. Unlike the tax returns, though, the Form 990, which can be extended for up to an additional six months, there is no extension allowed for this notice requirement. The second test for the Type 3 supporting organization is the responsiveness test. A Type 3 supporting org must be responsive to the needs or demands of its supported organizations. An organization can meet this test with regard to each particular supported organization if two subtests are met. Number one, the supported organization is adequately represented in the governing body of the supporting organization because the supported organization appoints at least one officer, director, or trustee of the supporting organization, or at least one member of the governing body of the supported organization also serves concurrently as an officer, director, or trustee of the supporting organization, or the officers, directors, or trustees of the supporting org and the supported org maintain a close and continuous working relationship. So those are the three subparts of adequate representation. And then number two in this responsiveness test is that because of this relationship, the supported organization has a significant voice in how the supporting org manages or uses its assets. So you can see this is a quite subjective test for the responsiveness part of a supporting organization, of a type three supporting org. The second thing to focus on here is the integral part test. And here it gets very detailed and complex. A Type 3 supporting org may be functionally integrated or non-functionally integrated. And this is a very important distinction for purposes of how the supporting organization operates. These Type 3 functionally integrated supporting organizations are subject to fewer restrictions and requirements than the non-functionally integrated supporting orgs. In essence, Type 3 non-functionally integrated supporting organizations are a kind of hybrid private foundation for certain purposes. Distributions from private foundations to Type 3 non-functionally integrated supporting orgs are not qualifying distributions for purposes of the grant or foundation's annual distributions and may be taxable expenditures under the taxable expenditure rules that apply to the grantor. In addition, the non-functionally integrated supporting orgs are also subject to excess business holding rules under Section 4943 and also have to meet annual payout requirements. So you can see non-functionally integrated supporting organizations are not particularly easy to manage because of these complex exceptions that apply both for their grantors and for their own operations. So it really matters if your type 3 is functionally integrated or non-functionally integrated. To be functionally integrated as a Type 3 supporting organization, the organization has to meet one of three alternative integral part tests. Alternative one is an activities test, which has two subtests, direct furtherance activities that but for the supporting organization doing the activity, the supported org would do it itself. To be more specific, the concept of direct furtherance means that substantially all 
of the supporting organization's activities, presumably that substantially all would mean 85%, directly furthers the exempt purposes of the supported organization. In other words, the supporting org is performing the functions of or directly carrying out the purposes of the supported organization and isn't just doing its own thing. In addition, those activities have to be the type of things that would normally be engaged in by the supported organization, but for the involvement of the supporting org. Examples might include things like holding title to exempt use property and managing exempt use property. These are activities that directly further the exempt purpose of the supported organization. But things like fundraising, investment management, or managing non-exempt use property and making grants are not generally activities that are treated as directly furthering the exempt purposes of the supported organization. So for a functionally integrated supporting organization, the second alternative is that the organization meets the functionally integrated test if it is the parent of the supported organization. So this is a pretty straightforward criteria. The supporting organization has the power to appoint a majority of the officers, directors, or trustees of its supported organizations. This works well in a complex structure where you want to have one parent that controls a number of subsidiaries, essentially, but the parent itself doesn't fundraise or meet public charity support requirements, so it can derive its public support classification from its subsidiaries. That's a very useful structure that I've seen before. And then functionally integrated alternative three is supporting a governmental entity. That's a rare specific occurrence that's relatively straightforward if the supporting org is actually supporting a governmental entity. So now let's turn our attention to the most complicated supporting organizations of all, complicated in terms of meeting the requirements to be treated as a non-functionally integrated type 3 supporting organization. Basically, these rules try to weed out organizations that are essentially private foundations that were exploiting the Type 3 supporting org features of 509A3 before the 2006 Act that introduced all of these complex rules. The 2006 Act created a complex set of rules to show that the supporting organization that's not functionally integrated really is responsive to the public and so should be free of the rigid private foundation rules. So there are two requirements to talk about here for the non-functionally integrated Type 3 supporting organization, the distribution requirement and the attentiveness requirement. In brief, the Type 3 non-functionally integrated supporting organization must distribute its distributable amount each year to one or more of its supported organizations. The distributable amount is the greater of 85% of the organization's adjusted net income for the prior year and 3.5% of the aggregate fair market value of the non-exempt use assets with certain adjustments. So that's the greater of those two measures, 85% of adjusted net income or 3.5% of fair market value of its non-exempt use assets. So this should sound very similar to the private foundation minimum distribution requirements. There's also a carry forward rule that allows certain excess amounts to be used in subsequent years. Again, similar concept to the private foundation rule. This distribution requirement requires the supporting org to distribute with respect to each taxable year on or before the last day of that year the amount, its distributable amount. These distributions have to be made to or for the use of one or more of its supported organizations. So the second part of this test here is the attentiveness requirement. It is not enough for a Type 3 non-functionally integrated supporting organization to make these minimum distributions. The distributions have to be important enough to the supported organization so the supported organization will pay attention to the supporting organization. Distributions to a particular supported organization are sufficient if they meet a bright line test of at least 10% of the supported organization's total support or either of a couple of subjective tests. These subjective tests are either of the following. The amount of the support was necessary to avoid interruption of a particular substantial function or activity of the supported organization, or based on all facts and circumstances, including actual evidence of attentiveness, the amount of the distribution to the supported organization was sufficient to ensure the attentiveness of the supported org to the supporting. And finally, to ensure that the supported organizations pay attention to the activities of the non-functionally integrated supporting organizations and provide the necessary oversight of their activities, the non-functionally integrated Type 3 supporting organization 
must distribute at least one-third of its annual distributable amount to one or more of the supported organizations that are attentive to the operations of the supporting org and to which the supporting org is responsive. So that's a lot of subjective tests and a few clear bright line tests. So again, to put this all in perspective, as I mentioned at the top of this episode, the non-functionally integrated Type 3 supporting organization can be very, very similar to a private foundation and operates with some of the same disadvantages. It has a similar minimum distribution requirement, and grants from private foundations and donor-advised funds are limited by special rules that apply to grants made to non-functionally integrated supporting organizations. So they're somewhat disfavored in that regard. So as you can see, the Type 3 supporting organization is a much more complex structure than the Type 1 or Type 2 supporting organization. And these are our structuring tools only to be taken in complex structures where it's really necessary to have a separately incorporated 501c3 that supports a one or more public charities. So that's all for this episode. I'm Cynthia Rowland, and you've been listening to EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferrella Brana Martel. If you have suggestions for topics you would like for us to discuss, please email us at eoradioshow at fbm.com. That's eoradioshow at fbm.com. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, make a difference. Make a difference.